Uh, ah, so someone just asked uh, about uh, homeworks and exams. So uh, I'll be posting your first homework set um, later today. So uh, so that answers that. I will be, like I said, I'll post first homework set um, a little bit later today, and it'll be due in like, I don't know, it'll be due maybe by Friday or something. Um, and then, uh, your exam. So, uh, I still haven't posted the like lecture schedule for the rest of the, uh, rest of the semester. So I'll post your exam, uh, schedule, uh, along with that. So, um, it's going to look at the exam breakdown. It might actually make sense to have, I think I'd said in the syllabus, I was going to have two, uh, exam or I was going to have three exams instead of, uh, of, I think I said I was going to have three exams. Did I say that? Uh, Three midterm exams. Yeah, I, I think what I'm going to do instead is have two. I think it makes more sense to have two uh, midterm exams. And so um, your first uh, exam won't be for, you know, uh, won't be for maybe like another month-ish or so. Um, so anyway, um, so more immediately pressing thing is, yeah, the homework, which, like I said, I'll sign uh, later later today. I'll send out an, you know, an announcement when I do that. I'm never going to anything that... Uh, you have that is graded in this course will be accompanied by at least one announcement so you never have to worry about missing something like that as long as you're paying attention to the announcements then uh you won't miss anything uh so remember your uh discussions are tomorrow uh they'll be conducted i mean all the the zoom meetings are already set up for the rest of the semester basically uh for those so they'll be conducted uh in the same way that they were last week um so uh, uh i will let you know beforehand um, if you're going to be doing uh, something in discussion that's going to count for some little part of a grade. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, on uh, the lecture that was supposed to uh, happen at the normal class time on Friday, um, but ended up not getting uploaded until, um, until yesterday. Uh, so basically I talked about the recasting of a linear system as a vector equation. So this vector equation um, where the x sub i's are real numbers so they are the weights they're the things being solved for here um, so this vector equation that has these weights multiplied by, by these vectors summed together is equal to some vector b has the same solution set as a linear system whose augmented matrix is this thing which i said yesterday this notation what i mean by that is it's the matrix that has each of these vectors as its columns Okay, so the first n columns are these first n vectors, a sub 1 through a sub n, and then the last column is the, the b, the right-hand side column. Um, in particular, b can be written as a linear combination of those vectors if and only if there exists a solution to that linear system corresponding to that matrix. So um, where this vector equation came from was the question, can the vector b be written as a linear combination of some list of given vectors a sub 1 through a sub n? So that question naturally arose to this vector equation so that a solution to this vector equation now wasn't being thought of as a solution to a linear system. It was being thought of as a solution to this uh, question of whether or not you could write a given vector as a linear combination of some other list of vectors. So um, it, we are going to do this over and over again in this course. We're actually going to do it one more time today um, where we take uh, a linear system the linear system goes into the background. We look at something totally different, okay? But it turns out that the solution set to that totally different thing turns out to be the exact same as a solution set to a linear system. And so it is just another way of thinking about a linear system. So part of this course is I will ask you a question in words, right? So I, there will be a list of vectors or there will be a matrix or there will be some quantities. And I will ask you a question that doesn't sound like I'm asking for a solution to a linear system, but it is going to be the same as solving a linear system. So for instance, if I gave you a vector, right, B, and then gave you a list of vectors and said, is B a linear combination of those vectors, right? I just asked you that question. To answer that question, you have to solve a linear system. Okay, so really what I'm doing is just coming up with another way of giving you a linear system to solve. Okay, that that's it. Um, of course, it's not just that. It's not just a creative way of writing homework or exam problems or quiz problems. It's also uh, a way of kind of showing you that all these things, um, you know, intuitively are linked together. Okay, so all these things are linked together. Now, um, I wanted to, as I said at the end of class yesterday, or uh, whenever, <laughs> whenever you watched it, um, 
so as I said at the end of class, uh, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about when it came to span. So if you had a set of vectors in Rn, uh, a linear combination of vectors looks like this. So these C sub i's are real numbers. They're your scalars. They're the weights of this linear combination. And so the set of all linear combinations of some set of vectors are, uh, is called the span. Okay, and so this is called the subset of Rn spanned uh, by those vectors. Okay, and it is the set of all vectors that can be written in this form. So this gives me another way of asking that same question, right? Rather than asking, is B a linear combination of some list of vectors, I could also ask, is B in the span of those vectors, right? So I could phrase this as, is B in the span of some set of vectors, okay? Ah, so someone also asked, if there's infinitely many solutions to a linear system, is but uh, is it also a linear combination? Yeah, but that just means there's infinitely many ways to write that linear combination. Okay, so that's what that's what that means. Okay, it, it means that there's not a single unique way of writing that linear combination, that there's more, there's more than that. Um, and if you think for a second what that means, it means that there's a free variable showing up somewhere there, right? Which means that one of those weights, at least one of those weights is there's a free choice involved and so you could you could choose it to be you know whatever okay uh, imagine right including like a zero vector in your question All right okay so um so uh oh yeah so what i was saying here um so yeah i could ask the same uh exact question i could say is b uh does b lie in the span of a set of vectors. So does B lie in the span of the vectors a sub 1 through a sub n? If this equation has a solution, then yes, and if it doesn't, then no, right? And if it has more than one solution, well, you're happy. It, it definitely lies in the span in that case. It's even even better. Okay, so yeah, and I said that here, asking whether or not a vector is in the span is, is just asking whether or not this has a solution, which is asking whether or not this linear system has a solution. Now, um, the thing I wanted to talk about is geometrically, what is going on uh, with uh, with the span? So geometrically, what uh, does the span of say U V look like if u and v are vectors in R2. All right, what does that look like? Well, actually, there's another associated question. So first, if u is a vector in R2, what does Just the span of U look like. So we'll call this question here question one, and then uh, we'll call this question question two. Okay. So the answer to two, what is that? Well, we talked about this during during Friday's lecture. What this is, what this is saying is that uh, if I have a vector u, there it is, okay, so here's my vector u, what does span u look like? Well, the span of a set of vectors is the set of all linear combinations of those vectors, but what's the span of a set that just contains a single vector? Well, what's the set of all linear combinations of a single vector? Well, I can add scalar multiples of a single vector to itself, but really that's the same as just scalar multiplying a single vector over and over again by different scalars, right? So what does this look like? Well, this is just the set of all scalar multiples of u. So it is, there's some scalar multiples of u, here's some others. So what is this actually? Well, this is a line, right? So this is 
a line. Do you notice anything wrong that I did though? Well, it turns out that what I did that was wrong here is I assumed that this vector u was not the zero vector, right? So someone said direction. If I had picked the u in the other direction, I would have gotten the, the other direction just fine. So the real issue here was that I assumed my u was non-zero, um, which is a typical assumption you might make, but I have to say that, right? So this is a line if u is not the zero vector, okay? Otherwise, it's a point. The collection of all linear combinations of the zero vector is just the zero vector itself. So otherwise, it is a point. Now, that might seem like a ridiculous assumption to make, or that might seem like a ridiculous case that you have to take care of here, but it's not. Okay, it, it seems that way because we only have a single vector here, but I'm going to show you in the answer to number one that this isn't something that's that's a ridiculous thing to take care of. In fact, this is going to show up uh, again and again throughout this course that we have to take care of this, but right now we're not going to discuss the terminology that's needed. Okay, but so in this case, uh, it's a line, but also it could be a point if it's the zero vector. So otherwise, i.e. if u is the zero vector, this is a point. Okay, so that's a possibility. Now, um, let's, so that answers two, but this at least gives you some concept of this answer depending on the vector u. Okay, uh, for one, what does the span of u and v look like? Someone said it's a plane. Well, sometimes, right? Sometimes it's a plane. Sometimes it's the entire plane. Um, in fact, you could think about this uh, in terms of, if you thought about this as these vectors sitting in R3, uh, you could say that, you know, maybe they generate a plane, but do they always generate a plane? Well, hmm. You automatically see, for the same reason, if one of these vectors here is the zero vector, then maybe something stupid happens, right? So if one of them is a zero vector, one of them is not the zero vector, then maybe you just get a line. So let's first assume that uh, neither of these are the zero vector. Okay, so neither of these are the zero vector. Just go ahead and assume that. That at least gets us out of this stupid thing, because if both of them are the zero vector, then we still just get a point. But that's that's a little bit stupid, so we'll 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 throw that aside. Okay, but is it always the full plane? No, of course not, right? So what if here is u and here is v? What if I have two vectors like this? Okay, so these are, this is the notion of parallel vectors, right? If you think about calc 3. So these two vectors are not zero vectors, but what's the span? of these two vectors. There's some redundant info here, right? Because they're scalar multiples of each other, there's some redundant info. And I end up getting just a line again. Okay. Now, if these things are in general position, right? If here's U and here's V, now the span of these things is the whole plane. Okay, but I could definitely have two vectors that line up like this. And so the span in this case is a line, which is one dimensional. The span in this case is a plane, which is two dimensional. So what is it that's going on here? How do I specify these two vectors not be in this form? And what about the question of three vectors, four vectors, having more than that? This is telling you that the idea of what's called linear independence is important. Okay, so these are the two simplest examples of linear dependence of vectors. Okay, so in the case of a single vector, linear dependence would mean that vector being the zero vector. In the case of two vectors, linear dependence means that the two vectors are scalar multiples of each other. In the case of three vectors, it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so in the case of three vectors, you can't say one of those two things. In the case of three vectors, 
you could have three vectors, none of which are the zero vector, none of which are scalar multiples of each other, but you still get some degenerate thing happening. Okay, so I'll explain what I mean by that when we get to it, but this is just to give you an idea of the background. Okay, so moving on, like I said, we'll, we'll get to that plenty. We'll be talking about that a lot. So moving on, I want to recast linear systems in one more way before doing more, and that is using matrix equations. So I want to discuss the matrix equation AX equals B. Now, for various reasons, this is probably the most convenient form that the, these equations we're studying are going to take. So I've already spilled the beans here on the first day of class. I said that this entire class is the study of this single equation, AX equals B. Um, so uh, technically, I know that most of you know how to multiply matrices. That's not an issue. But technically, we don't multiply matrices until Chapter 2. Okay, and so I have to actually define what it means to have a matrix A multiplied by uh, by a vector X. Okay, so uh, here's the definition. So this is just the definition of this matrix equation. So if A is an M by N matrix, I'm not going to waste my time writing that out. So when I write that, that means A is an M by N matrix. Okay, so if A is an M by N matrix... Uh, with columns uh, a sub 1, a sub 2, and so on, up to a sub n. Okay, and if x is in Rn, then the product of a and X uh, is the linear combination. So this is the lincom of the columns of A of A using the corresponding entries in X as weights. in the vector x as weights. So that's what this is. Of course, if you know how to multiply matrices, you could treat x as a matrix. A vector is a matrix uh, itself. So this is still just the multiplication of matrices, i.e. A times x can be thought of as the matrix that has columns A1 through An multiplied by a vector, which I write as a column, x of 1, x of 2, down to x of n. Note these don't have bars above them because those entries are real numbers. They're not vectors. So this is uh, a, or sorry, x sub 1 times a sub 1 plus x sub 2 times a sub 2, and so on, all the way up to x sub n times a sub n. Notice that if x doesn't have n entries exactly, this is technically not defined, right? This has to have the exact same number of entries as a has columns. Of course, we'll take care of all of that when we talk about matrices, but that shouldn't surprise you, right? You can't just multiply any two matrices. Things have to match up, okay? All right. So I don't have to... I don't have to go here. Let's just do a single example. There's no reason doing too much. You guys don't need to see too much of this. So I'm going to read row-wise here. 1, 2, minus 1, 0, uh, minus 5, 3 uh, times the vector. Of course, I need three entries since this has three columns. So this is 4, 3, 7. Okay, so then how do I do this? This is so an easy way of thinking about this is this is going to be 4 times the vector 1, 0 plus uh, 3 times the vector 2 minus 5 uh, plus 7 times the vector minus 1, 3. So then this is uh, these three vectors. Here, I'll write it here. So these three vectors are 4, 0 uh, plus 6 minus 30. Uh, plus um, minus 7 times uh, 21. 
Okay, so let's uh, put those all together into a single vector here. So 4 plus 6 is 10 minus 7, that's 3. And 0 minus 30 plus 21, that's minus 9. Right. Oh, wait. 3 times minus 5, that's not minus 30. What am I doing here? This is minus 15. Okay, so then this would be 6, positive 6 here. Okay, failing multiplication tables. Uh, yeah, three times minus five is thirty. That's a that's a really that's a really good. Oh, I'm out of the. See, you didn't even see. I shouldn't have even told on myself. I was out of the. I was out of the camera view. I didn't even have to admit that I made a mistake here. Right. Yep. The paper is moved up. Okay. So, yeah, I I didn't even have to tell on myself there. All right. So anyway, um, so this is how this is done. Um, of course, you know, you're, you're going to think of other ways. This is the quickest way of doing this when you have matrix times uh, vector like this. But of course, um, this is just a special case of, of multiplying matrices. Okay, so that's how, that's how this goes. All right. So um, that is multiplying matrix by vector. Okay, so there's the following theorem, which matches this theorem that we had for uh, vector equations, which is the following. So this is very important, just like that past one was important. So theorem. Uh, if A is an M by N matrix, so if A is an M by N matrix, uh, and it has columns um, A sub 1 through A sub N, Okay, uh, and if B is an Rn, then the matrix equation AX is equal to B has the same solution set as the vector equation which is x sub 1 a1 plus x sub 2 a2 and so on up to x sub n a sub n is equal to b but we already saw something about that vector equation that ve so this this is nothing this requires no proof this is a definition right we just we just wrote that definition out right so this definition that we just wrote says that oh no that's not the definition i was looking at it's this one so here this definition that we just wrote says that a times x is this linear combination using the entries of x as the weights and the columns of a as the vectors a times x is that linear combination. So ax equals b is literally this vector equation. There's nothing that needs to be proven there. That's the definition of a times x. So of course, this matrix equation has the same solution set as this vector equation. But then from last lecture, this vector equation has the same solution set as this linear system that has this augmented matrix here. So I can rewrite that in the following way, which has the same solution set as the linear system whose augmented matrix is a sub 1, a sub 2, and so on, up to a sub n and b as the last column. Okay. So this gives us three ways of thinking about a linear system. There's the matrix way, right, as a matrix equation. There is the vector equation way. And there is the linear system way. Okay, and what this theorem says is that these three ways are completely equivalent. It doesn't matter which of these three ways you use to think about it, you get the exact same solutions. Okay. 
All right. So here is where some subtlety comes in. Uh, so this is the augmented matrix for a linear system. But when you write the matrix equation AX equals B, suddenly there is another matrix that shows up, this matrix A. This is called the coefficient matrix. Notice that it is not the augmented matrix. The augmented matrix for the system associated to this equation is not the coefficient matrix. It never is, right? In fact, the augmented matrix is the matrix that the left side of that matrix looks like I just slapped the matrix A in there, and the last column of that matrix is B, right? That right-hand side vector. Okay, so the coefficient matrix sits inside the augmented matrix, but it's never equal to the augmented matrix. This might seem like a completely trivial thing, but the reason I want to stress this is that we're going to be saying a lot of facts. We're going to be saying a lot of properties. We're going to be talking about properties of the coefficient matrix and the augmented matrix. And a lot of what you want to say about augmented matrices is not true for coefficient matrices. So, for instance, we saw that in the augmented matrix, right, the existence of a row of all zeros um, was was perfectly fine for solutions, for, for solutions existing. We're going to see that for coefficient matrices, that there's some there's there's something that goes into that that makes that not quite what you think. Similarly, for an augmented matrix, uh, what meant that there was no solutions was that you had a bunch of zeros and then the last entry was a non-zero entry. But that's not true for coefficient matrices. For coefficient matrices, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so we'll get into those things when we talk about these things more conceptually. Okay, so um, another way of thinking about all this stuff. So another way of phrasing this. way of phrasing this is the following. Um, so here's a fact that follows from that previous theorem. The equation AX equals B has a solution if and only if B is a linear combination of the columns of A. Okay. All right. Okay, we could actually recast this in so many different ways. I could phrase this as, does B lie in the span of the columns of A, right? So an yet another way of writing this is, does B lie in the span? When I say lie in the span, that's just an English way of, of saying this. Saying, you know, is B in the span, that's the same thing. This, is, this has no geometric meaning. This is just, just sounds nice. So does B lie in the span of the columns of A? That is another question I could ask. Okay. All right. So this is a question of existence that's pretty straightforward. There's one that's a little bit more involved. So here's an example that shows something else that could be asked here. Okay, so let, uh, let's let let uh, A be the matrix. Uh, one, I'm going to read row-wise. So 1, 3, 4, minus 4, 2, uh, minus 6, and minus 3, minus 2, minus 7. Okay, uh, and let B be completely general. So B sub 1, B sub 2 and B sub 3. Okay. So the question is the equation 
AX equal B consistent, that is, does it have at least one solution, for all possible B1, B2, and B3? Hmm. Hmm, okay. So how do I answer this question? Well, as I said, basically every question in the course can be answered by row reducing some matrix, okay? So uh, what matrix would that be? It would be the augmented matrix for this equation, AX equals B, okay? So what's the augmented matrix for AX equals B? Uh, that is the matrix, I'm gonna read row wise again, one, three, four, B sub one. Uh, minus 4, 2, minus 6, B sub 2, and minus 3, minus 2, minus 7, B sub 3. Okay, I want to row reduce this. So what's the first thing I do? Uh, this is my good old row reduction algorithm. I want to zero out these entries. So uh, 4 times row 1 plus row 2, replacing row 2, will zero out that entry. 3 times row 1 plus row 3, replacing row 3, will zero out that entry. So my first row is unchanged. So this is 1, 3, 4, B sub 1. Zeroing out this entry, I have uh, 4 times 1 is 4, plus minus 4 is 0. 4 times 3 is 12, plus 2 is 14. Uh, 4 times 4 is 16, plus minus 6 is 10. And then lastly, 4 times b sub 1 plus b sub 2 is, well, that's just 4 times b sub 1 plus b sub 2. No other way of writing that, right? Um, okay, so zeroing out this third entry uh, here, or this first entry in the third row, uh, this is 3 times 1 is 3 plus minus 3 is 0. Uh, next, I have 3 times 3 is 9 plus minus 2 is minus 7. Uh, oh, wait a minute, that's not minus 7, that's just 7. Uh, so this is just seven there. I write my sevens like that anyway. Um, okay. So, uh, three times four is 12, uh, plus, uh, minus seven is five. And then three times B sub one is three B sub one plus B sub three. So this is three B sub one plus B sub three. Okay. All right. Oh, look how lucky I am, right? I can zero out these entries really easily here. So I'm going to do that. What will what will zero out these two entries? All I have to do is minus one half, minus one half row, second row plus third row, replacing third row. What do I get here? I'm going to leave this bracket open because I'm going to need more room down here. So uh, I'm not changing the first two rows. So this is one, three, four, B sub one, and uh, zero, 14, 10, four B sub one plus B sub two. Okay, so then uh, here's zero. Here's minus one half times 14 is minus seven plus seven is zero. Minus one half times 10 is minus five plus five is zero. Uh, minus one half times four B sub one plus B sub two plus 3b sub 1 plus b sub 3 is, well, I'm just going to write this as, this is 3b sub 1 plus b sub 3 minus 1 half times 4b sub 1 plus b sub 2. And that is my very annoying last entry. Okay. So, this is my augmented matrix, row reduced to row echelon form. Okay, what needs to be true for this to be consistent? All right, note, if three B sub one plus B sub three minus one half times four B sub one plus B sub two is not zero, then this 
system is inconsistent. So the question, is the equation consistent for all possible b sub 1, b sub 2, b sub 3? No, because I could choose this to be non-zero. So to choose this to be non-zero, what do I have to do here? Uh, let b sub 1 and b sub 2 be 0 and let b sub 3 be 1, right? So choose uh, b sub 1 and b sub 2 to be 0 and b sub 3 to be 1. So if b sub 1 and b sub 2 are 0, then all these terms go away. And if b sub 3 is 1, then I have 1. Clearly not 0. System's inconsistent. Okay. So answering questions like this, again, it's just row reduction. I just have to keep track of my row reduction operations on these generic entries. Right? Yeah, you can simplify it, but it doesn't, I, I mean, it doesn't matter. I didn't want to, I wasn't going to waste any time simplifying it because I could just, since the question you know, gives me all the freedom I want to answer this. I don't, I don't need to simplify it, but yeah, you could, I mean, geometrically, I could even ask you a question of like, explain, you know, geometrically what the collection of, you know, vectors satisfying, uh, uh, this thing being consistent or inconsistent is, you know, I could, I'll, I'll talk about that maybe, you know, later, uh, a couple chapters down the road. Okay, so this is an example of, of what's going on. Of course, you know, I could even say, like, what, when is this consistent? Well, it's consistent whenever this quantity is equal to zero. And what does this describe geometrically, as I was just saying? It describes a plane, right? So what does this, what does this describe? So note, if I simplify... What, uh, what is that? Note, uh, b sub 1 uh, minus 1 half b sub 2 uh, plus b sub 3 is equal to 0 implies, I think that was the simplification of this, so let's see here. Uh, here. So 3b sub 1 minus 1 half b sub, yeah, so that's uh, 1b sub 1, yep, plus b sub 3, yep, and minus 1 half b sub 2, yep, that's it. Okay, so uh, this implies that that AX equals B uh, is consistent. Okay. What is this geometrically? What, what is that? This is a plane in R3. So this is a plane in R3. Okay. All right. So what this is saying is geometrically there is a plane's worth of vectors that I could choose in R3 that would actually allow AX equals B to be consistent. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a neat uh, fact. Uh, and these are the types of things that you're going to be, these are the types of qualitative things you could be asked um, in this course. Okay. Uh, so... Um, continuing on, uh, there is the following theorem. Okay, which is kind of tying in all of this terminology that we've developed up till now. Okay, um, so, oh, uh, oh, well, so, uh, let's see, so that is, so keep in mind. Um, so someone is asking, why is their simplification wrong? Uh, one, uh, if you have this thing equal to zero, you're free to, you can do whatever you want to here, right? So if you want to multiply both sides by minus two, that's fine because the right side is zero. So it doesn't matter um, if that's what you're worried about. So uh, anyway, uh, this theorem that I'm going to write out ties together a lot of this terminology um, that, uh, that we've been... Uh, or that we've developed up till now. So let uh, A be an M by N matrix. Uh, again, that's my abbreviation for that. Then, this is the first time in this class I'm going to say this, but it is certainly not the last, so you're going to have to get used to this. I'm going to write it out this time, and then I'll never write it again. So then, the following are 
equivalent. I will never write those words again in this course because instead of writing those words, I will write T-F-A-E. The following are equivalent. This is a phrase that is said so often in this course that if I wrote it every single time it showed up, that would probably waste something like over the whole semester, like 30 minutes or something. So I'm going to not do that. I'm always going to write T-F-A-E. So the following are equivalent. What does that mean? It means the following are logically equivalent, not kind of, sort of equivalent. It means that as logical statements, they imply one another in both directions. So one implies the other, the other implies that one. So each of these could be connected by an if and only if statement or an if and only if double-sided arrow. Okay, so what does it mean when I say that the following are equivalent, what is I'm talking about? So that is, you know, I could say one more time, that is either all are true or all are false. So if a single one of these is true, all of them are true. If a single one of these is false, all of them are false. So it's four things. So first thing, for each B in RM, the equation AX equals B has a solution. Now, even though uh, this is the first thing I write down in this theorem, it's actually not the... This is important because this is what we're interested in, but it's the other three properties that are the more interesting things because they're the things that aren't obvious why we're interested in them. Okay. So that is equivalent to the next three things, which is for each B or... I shouldn't say for each. I said that the first thing. So let me rewrite this. So this is a each B in RM uh, is a linear combination of the columns of A. Okay, the next thing is the columns of A span RM. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that the span of the columns of A is equal to RM. So the terminology that we use there is using span as a verb. Right, so saying that the columns of A span some set is to say that that set is equal to the span of, of whatever set of vectors I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. And then lastly, A has a pivot position in every row. Now, here's where I want to draw your attention to some stuff. Okay, so first of all, all of these things I wrote are equivalent to this equation, AX equals B, uh, having a solution for each B in RN. Notice that might seem a little weird for you at first since we asked this question, is it possible that this equation AX equals B is consistent for all possible B sub 1, B sub 2, B sub 3. We saw that this particular A, that wasn't possible. Okay, uh, so that's, you know, this was something that, uh, or I should say, sorry, it was possible, but it's not true for all possible B sub 1, B sub 2, B sub 3s that this was the case. Okay, so the question is, um, is there some A for which this is consistent for any possible choice here of B sub 1, B sub 2, B sub 3? The answer is yes. I could have an A that is nice enough that this, this happens regardless of what B is. So this is going to be consistent regardless of what B is. That might seem a little crazy 
uh, you know, that, that you could have uh, a matrix A that satisfies that. But looking at this theorem, if this isn't going to describe something totally stupid, that has to be the case. Because the very first thing I'm saying is that for every B in RM, this equation has a solution. So if that never happened, then what am I doing writing all this stuff, right? So this happens. And when this happens, these conditions are telling me exactly what's going on. So the next thing that this says, it's maybe not as interesting, is that each, every single B in RM is a linear combination of the columns of A. Okay, well, I know that those two things are equivalent. That's, I got that straight out of the definition. The columns of A span RM. Again, you know, this is just tying up terminology. These first three things, I'm not really saying that much. This is the thing that is important. Okay. So if I know two or three, I know one, that, that's not amazing. What's more amazing is reducing these three questions to the single check, does it have a pivot position every row? Okay, and here's what I want to draw your attention to. When I talk about a pivot position every row, I'm talking about A, the coefficient matrix. So this is the coefficient matrix for the equation AX equals B, okay, not the augmented matrix, okay, because note that an augmented matrix having a pivot position in every row is not necessarily a good thing, right? In fact, if an augmented matrix has a bad pivot position, <laughs> that is, if it has one of these rows that looks like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 1, for instance, that's bad, for an augmented matrix. That actually says the opposite. It says that that system associated to it doesn't have a solution. It's inconsistent. Okay, this is the exact opposite. So the reason why this makes sense is because what we're talking about is not an augmented matrix now. It is A, the coefficient matrix for this system. Okay, so we're looking for this thing to have pivot position in every row. Okay. So uh, if, if A has a pivot position in every row, then AX equals B always has a solution, whatever B is. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty amazing uh, fact here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do this. Um, so uh, let's compute uh, the following. Actually, maybe before I say anything else, I'll mention a couple of properties of the matrix vector product, and then since we only have a couple minutes left, I think that's more or less all I wanted to do uh, for for matrix stuff at the moment before we move on. Um, but that is a very uh, important uh, fact. So here's one more theorem. Uh, so uh, matrix algebra rules. This is not going to be the first time, or sorry, the last time we talk about these. So uh, if A is an M by N matrix, uh, and U and V are vectors. I put the bar over them in RN. Uh, and C is a scalar, that is, it's just a real number. Then, one, if I multiply matrix times a vector sum, this is just sum of those matrix products. And secondly, if I multiply a matrix times a scalar product, this is just scalar product of matrix times vector. Okay. So again, you might already be taking these sorts of things for granted um, as just being obvious from your previous uh, use of matrices, but the, these are important, so you're going to use these, um, you're going to use these properties uh, a lot, especially if I ask you some conceptual uh, questions about this stuff. Okay, so um, this theorem that I had on before is very important. I'll be referring to it a bunch, and we'll see, um, we'll see where this comes in uh, a lot a bit, uh, a bit later, but for now, this allows you to answer a question of whether or not the, an AX equals B has a solution. So uh, if, you know, if this thing has a, if A has a pivot position in every row, 
you don't even care what B is, right? Because this thing is going to have a solution regardless of, of B. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice fact. This actually tells you that uh, in this case, you can actually kind of ignore the augmented matrix entirely and work on the matrix A itself. Aha! That is a, uh, that is a, uh, a very strong thing. So what ultimately this theorem tells me is that who cares about the system? Right? What do I mean by that? Well, the thing, this number one that I'm looking at says that regard, it doesn't matter what B is, AX equals B has a solution if my pivot position, or if A has a pivot position in every single row. So a way of thinking about this is, if all I care about is questions of whether or not this thing has a solution, then I can toss out the, the underlying system and just focus my efforts on A, right? So I can toss out the underlying linear system. So linear system gives rise to vector equation, which gives rise to matrix equation. So I get this coefficient matrix A, but then it turns out that all the things I wanna know about a linear system are actually encoded in the matrix A, really. Uh, in question. And so the study of these linear systems is really just the study of the matrices. And so what I can do and what I'm going to do right out of chapter one, when we get out of chapter one, this is the first thing we're going to do is I can put the, I can put my focus on uh, the linear system itself kind of in the background and just focus on the matrix, uh, uh, and properties of the matrix uh, itself. Okay, so anyway, I think that's all I wanted to, to say today. So I ended up not talking about parametric vector form. Uh, I'll do that in like, I'll actually have your TAs uh, mention this uh, in discussion tomorrow, and then I'll do it in literally like 10 minutes on Wednesday, and then we'll move on. We'll basically be done, uh, not done entirely, but we'll be almost done with chapter one by, by Wednesday. Okay. Uh, or by the end of this week, uh, I should say. So anyway, uh, I am going to uh, end it here because I think we're out of time. So um, remember, you have discussion tomorrow. I'll post your homework later today. Um, and uh, I will see you all on Wednesday after that.